Hallelujah. Christ is risen. The Lord is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O God, whose blessed Son made himself known to his disciples in the breaking of bread, open the eyes of our faith that we may behold him in all his redeeming work, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. We invite those children who would like to go out for children's ministry time to gather in the back. Our first reading is from Paul's first letter to John. See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The reason the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now. What we will be has not yet been revealed. What we do know is this, when he is revealed, we will be like him, for we will see him as he is. And all who have this hope in him purify themselves, just as he is pure. Everyone who commits sin is guilty of lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he was revealed to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him sins. No one who sins has either seen him or known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. Everyone who does what is right is righteous, 
just as he is righteous. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gospel of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, <clears throat> excuse me, according to Luke. Glory, Glory to you, Lord Jesus himself stood among the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, 
have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, these are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Christ. speak to you today in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So we heard the passage from 1 John a few moments ago as part of our New Testament reading, and no show of hands, but how many of us heard that 1 John passage and thought, man, John, calm it down a bit. <laughs> that is, that's a tough one. Uh, if we're honest, I think this is one of those passages in Scripture that we just need to admit makes us a little uncomfortable. There are no easy words here in John's appeal to this community, uh, and it can be difficult uh, to, to fathom. And today we want to dive into this tricky passage and hear some words of life, some true life uh, from the epistle. Uh, I want to back up just a minute and set the stage. Uh, the author of this letter, perhaps one of Jesus' 12 disciples, is writing to a community in turmoil. One of the things we think happened right before John wrote this letter is that the community was torn apart uh, and part of the church deserted uh, the other half and John writes to this kind of broken, kind of beleaguered, hurting community uh, that remained. I think that's helpful to know because when we hear the kind of shocking words of John, he isn't trying to put people on a guilt trip or beat them over the head. Uh, he's trying to comfort and encourage uh, a community uh, who needs it. He's speaking to those in the community that remained who may be tempted to doubt that they made the right decision. And I think that's worth remembering as we walk through the passage. I think it's also important to, of course, start where John starts. Before we go anywhere else in the passage, before those difficult and tricky words, notice John's excitement about his community. Notice where he begins. He says, see what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called the children of God, and that is what we are. Before whatever comes next is this profound reality that you are loved and you are a child of God. John wants to spend some time on the implications of what it means to be God's children. And it's hard to underestimate how revolutionary this idea is. How would our world be different if we reviewed everyone as someone who was beloved by God? How would our interactions change with one another? John's imagery here is rooted in the family, and this is key to where he goes next. He's going to talk about children. 
John says, like little children, our growth is not complete yet. He says in verse 2, what we will be has not yet been revealed. John says there's something incomplete at this current moment. And like children, we are all still growing. All of us together, it doesn't matter if we're 2 or 92. In terms of our faith, we are always in development. One of the fun things, of course, about watching little babies and little children grow up is wondering just who they will become. Our kids are almost five and almost three, and it's fun to watch kids play and wonder what their brains are thinking and what they might eventually do one day in their lives, who they will become, what will matter to them, what course will be set for their life. And of course, if you're a parent, a grandparent, an aunt, or an uncle, you've probably done the same thing, wondering how these children will grow, grow up healthy, strong, and know that they are loved. We have dreams and aspirations, but we have to wait and watch. We have to see how that development progresses. And John's going to play with that idea here in verse 2. John looks at us and says, as a child of God, what we will be has not yet been made known. But when Jesus appears again, we will be like him, he says. Because you see, there's something transformative about seeing Jesus. It will transform all of us. Remember all those persons in the Gospels who met Jesus and their lives were liberated and transformed. The outcasts, the downtrodden, those without hope, they met Jesus and their lives were turned around. Like waiting for little children to grow up, John says we await too. And similarly, similarly, in our transformation as a child of God, wherever we're at, it's John's hope that the love of God begins to characterize our life in that familial resemblance to God. And the day is coming, John says, when we will be full grown and look like God completely, entirely transformed. And so it seems early on here that John is thinking about the future. But that is only somewhat true. His, his focus is not entirely on the future. You see, John is going to set up a time frame for us in the passage. Twice in this passage, he's going to use this verb to appear. But the English grammar nerds among us will notice a few little things. Those two verbs are not the same. S spare the English lesson here. One is in the future tense, and one is in the past tense. All right, I'll get that. This word for appearing, of course, is the same word that we use for epiphany, the Greek word epiphanos. And John wants us to celebrate two epiphanies. He's super Anglican. One epiphany, <laughs> not enough. We, we need two. There's one that's already happened, the one we do celebrate in our calendar, right? Uh, Jesus being born, the incarnation. But for John, there's also an epiphany that is yet to come, the return of Jesus, and for John, we stand between these two epiphanies, these two appearings of Jesus. And this is where John actually begins to focus in on today's passage. What should it look like for the children of God to live between the two epiphanies? John says this, he says, verse 3, All who have this hope in them purify themselves just as he is pure. John says that because we have this hope, this hope that we will be like Christ, we make certain choices now. It affects the middle. Or to put it another way, the end of the story determines the middle of the story. Where the story is going has profound effect on how we are living through the story right now. As many of you might know, my wife Lisa is a runner. She's back there. Um, she runs races all the time. She just, a couple weekends ago, ran the half marathon in D.C. Um, and part of knowing that race day is coming, of course, is preparing, hopefully well in advance, uh, <laughs> to be able to run that race well. I don't encourage running a marathon the day before, right, with no training. So months in advance of race day, she begins running. Two miles, three miles, five miles, then ten, and then numbers that will make you cry, right? <laughs> so, just weird numbers, practicing and practicing for the race that is about to come. So she's what? Ready. I, of course, uh, am great at watching. That's what I do. But I do my own preparations, don't worry. But this involves me scouting the race course for great places for coffee and things to eat. That is my preparation on Google Maps. Uh, it is a preparation of a different kind, but preparation nonetheless. So I'm also prepared for race day. Um, similarly, John says that 
Because we will be light, Jesus, we start that process now. And here we get to that funny little Christian word, purity, or pure. The term purity is related to the concept of holiness, also another funny little Christian word. And these terms often have so much baggage, and if we're honest, these terms have often been weaponized to some pretty horrendous ends. So let's clear a few things up this morning. If we want to get a clue on what it means to be holy, we must look to Jesus. As Roland Williams has noted, he says, Holiness in the New Testament is a matter of Jesus going right into the middle of the mess and the suffering of human nature. For him, being holy is, is about being absolutely involved, not being absolutely separated. Contrary to popular opinion, holiness is not about abstracting ourselves from this world, but radically involving oneself with this world. Holiness is seen, of course, in God's radical love of entering into relationship with his creation, not as withdrawal from it. His holiness is seen in coming towards us, not in running away. And likewise, our holiness is to look like God's character, a radical self-giving love for the sake of others. This is what it means to be holy. Rome goes on to say, if we take this seriously, the Christian idea of holiness is, is to do with going where it's most difficult. In the name of Jesus who went there, where it was most difficult, he wants us to be holy like that. What we see is that self-giving love in the first epiphany. In fact, in verse 5, John says, the first epiphany was when Jesus appeared to take away sins. The removal of the power of sin was one of the main aims of Jesus. In fact, in our gospel stories, this is why John the Baptist, remember, says, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Sin, again, is one of those funny little Christian words with a colorful history. But at its core, sin seems to be a deforming vandalization of God's good world. It deforms God's good created world. It's a marring of creation from what God intended it to be. So the removal of sin is about restoration, about putting things back together, not just of us, but of the world too. The removal of sin is allowing us to be truly human, truly as God created us to be. And so it appears that one of the reasons God sent Jesus among the many was to undo all that brokenness that marks our world, the injustice, the evil, or as Tolkien put it in Return of the King, is everything sad going to come untrue? This is why Jesus was sent. Part of God's answer in renewing the world, of course, is sending Jesus to put the world right side up. But that, I would argue, is only part of the plan. The second part is involving his children to be part of that renewal work, to rid the world of sin and injustice. That brokenness of our world, of course, is both in us and around us. The endless, world, the endless wars that rage around our world and the wars that we create with one another. The racial hatred that pervades our country and the ways that we neglect our neighbors. The heartbreaking poverty in our city and country and the ways we fail to be generous. It's also the reason why in our prayer of confession we ask for forgiveness for things done and things left undone the wrong that we participated in, and also the good that we failed to do. This is what holiness is for, putting the world back together. But now we get to that difficult part of the passage in verse 6, where John says this, if you remember, you probably tensed up a little bit, no one who lives in him keeps on sinning. No one who continues to sin has either seen him or known him. John's statements here, of course, are both vigorous and uncompromising. And if we're honest, they make us maybe a little uncomfortable with their stark reality. Because if we're honest, right, these statements seem both, one, overstated, and two, inconsistent with human experience. So how is this good news for us today? Remember, John is writing these next verses to a community he wants to encourage. You may think he could do a better job, but nonetheless, <laughs> that's his purpose. This isn't a chance, I think, for, I don't think this is a chance for John to hit them over the head, send them on a guilt trip, reprimand them for all the sinning. John's big idea in this passage is that we are children of God, a God of justice 
to whom we bear resemblance. Remember all the being born language in the passage. John returns that here with this family imagery. And here in verse 7, he actually refers to his audience as dear children, a term of love and affection. Uh, show of hands, how many of you are familiar with the website Ancestry.com? Maybe you've done one of their at-home DNA testing kits, right? The process is that if you send in some of your DNA, they can match you and find out where you're from. So you send in a little bottle of saliva, they can pinpoint down what part of the world your ancestors came from. It establishes a link to an identity and to a people. John's going to do something similar here, but with behavior. John sees this familial relationship between one's actions and one's spiritual parent. Because our identity is transformed, our actions are to be consistent with this new identity as God's children. It's as if John is saying, put your behavior in a test tube and I can show you where you're from. Righteousness or justice is the genetic trait of God. The part that we're uncomfortable with, of course, is that our behavior becomes a primary identity marker. And we could be left here in a moment of despair, but in an unexpected moment, John awakens us to the story of the gospel by the reminder of the epiphany. John is, seems to be so adamant to look at our behavior because he's so committed to the work of God and Jesus to destroy the works of sin, brokenness, and evil that is both in us and around us. John says it's as if sin is saying that you're playing for the wrong team. It's a sign that you've scored a basket in the wrong goal. You're meant to be part of the work to restore the world, not its deformation. But how is this encouragement to you and me? Don't forget verse 1 of the passage. What did John say there? See what love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God, and that is what we are. The encouragement of John here is to live into your identity as God's child. To, to put to death the deeds of sin both in us and in the world around us. The encouragement that God's character becomes your character. That God's heart for justice becomes your heart for justice. This is the call to justice not just on an individual level but on a communal level as well. When we work against sin and injustice it's a participation in the work of Jesus to do the things that Jesus is already up to in this world. Which is destroying the things that wreck our world. And it also encourages us that we are God's children. So if the people around us are experiencing injustice, do we care? Or do we find an explanation to explain away injustice so that there's no responsibility? The call to love one another is, as Jesus shows, a deep, costly decision. The call to love someone else comes at a deep personal cost to ourselves. And the call to live as God's children is not just something that you and I do individually, but something we do as a community. If John says one sign that we are God's children is our love for one another, how do we begin to live that way here and now? Of course, this is at the heart of St. Andrew's in the final phrase of our mission, to be transformed by God. This is where John is going. So as we think about this final stage, John is encouraging us to remember who we are as God's children. And as we move to the table, we are reminded of the great invitation of God to participate in his work in this world, to renew, restore, and redeem all that is broken, and to take part in making all the sad things come untrue. And as John encourages us to do this, he, he reminds us of the spirit that has indwelled us, and the table calls us to feed on Christ, to be indwelt by his spirit, and to be sent out into this world to make a difference, not just in this world, in this life, but in the life to come. Amen. Amen. Let us stand and affirm our faith using the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father of the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, <coughs> eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, 
of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshiped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. The prayers of the people are form three, found on page 387 in the Book of Common Prayer. Let us pray. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. That your name may be glorified by all people. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. That they may be faithful ministers of your word and sacraments. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. That there may be justice and peace on the earth. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. In the Anglican cycle of prayer, we pray for New Zealand and Polynesia today. In the diocesan cycle of prayer, we remember this community of St. Andrews, St. Barnabas, and St. Francis, all in Greensboro. We pray for the departed Amos Fisher, and we especially remember Barbara Cook and the missioners to Costa Rica. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, peace I give to you. My own peace I leave with you. Regard not our sins, but the faith of your church, and give to us the peace and unity of that heavenly city, where with the Father and the Holy Spirit you live and reign now and forever. Amen. Amen. Beautiful, beloved children of God, the peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you.
What did I say about the peace last week? <laughs> so good morning and welcome to St. Andrews. We're so glad that you are worshiping with us this morning. Um, there are welcome cards if you would like to fill one out in the, in the pews in front of you so that we can get to know you a bit better. Here at St. Andrews, we are committed to feeding the hungry, to welcoming the stranger, and to being transformed by God. And we would love for you to be part of our mission and ministry here. So there are quite a few announcements. A couple things I want to say have to do with the funerals. We've had quite a few funerals and have a few more. Um, this Friday, we will have a funeral for Stephen Ritchie at 2. It will be here in the sanctuary. And then next Monday, um, we will also have a funeral for Wes Hood. It will also be here in the sanctuary. One of the things that Dottie Clark said early on has always stayed with me, which is we are the church and we show up at funerals here. Um, and that is true. We had a beautiful service on Thursday for Joyce Cudd, and it's one of the things that I love about St. Andrews. We show up to give one another back to the God who created us. So after church today, we will have week two of formation about 1 John. Um, the lovely Phil Verano will be leading that, and it will be in the library. So find your space there. We will also have coffee and conversation in the parish hall. There is a soup sale encore. So if you didn't get your soup, I hope that you will get some soup today after church. It's great to put it in the freezer. The Inmans have certainly been enjoying it. Um, but remember that it also goes to benefit the Safi family. That is the family from Afghanistan, the refugee family that some, our whole church has supported, but some in our church have been walking with since they arrived. Oh, EYC is tonight, filling hearts and bellies with the cap-offs. We will also begin, hi, here he comes. We will also begin um, our Good News Garden. So next Sunday, we will celebrate Earth Day, and our children and youth will go out during the service to actually plant in the beginning of what will be our Good News Garden. And it's going to be here, kind of on the way to the farmer's market. It's small, but we're going to start somewhere, and it will be a garden that anyone who needs food can pick from. Um, Palmer McIntyre will also be here. I think many of you know Palmer. She's very active in the community, but she's going to have a special community conversation for us. She has worked for many years um, for the Piedmont Land Conservation Group, and she also spearheaded the Year of the Trail. She has just written a book along with what Jason said, that is called Trails and Treats. <laughs> so it is going to have information both about where the trails are and where you can get good food and libations. So lastly, I just want to say, if you haven't signed up for the Senior and Youth Dinner, which will be next Sunday evening, I hope you will do so. Can I invite those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries? Oh. Yep. Yeah. Those celebrating birthdays and anniversaries to come forward while Charles makes his way. Good morning, I'm Charles Kapoff. One of the things I do at St. Andrews is to promote goodies for coffee and conversation. And I've been out of town for three weeks, so the first thing I did this morning was I went to the parish hall for two reasons. One, to deliver an enormous jar of Costco's peanut butter filled pretzels, which is Rob Moore's favorite morning snack. <laughs> the other thing I did was I looked for the coffee hour sign up sheet and it's hidden on the back side of the bulletin board. And I went to her and she's very, very lonely. There's almost no sign-ups. So if you're so moved, please sign up for coffee and conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Bill Hill is turning 90. <laughs> so come here. 
praise the Lord. <laughs> so there are so many things I love about these people gathered here today. Let us pray for those celebrating birthdays this day. Watch over these your children, O Lord, as their days increase, bless and guide them wherever they may be. Strengthen them when they stand. Comfort them when discouraged or sorrowful. Raise them up if they fall. And in their hearts, may your peace, God, pass all our understanding and abide all the days of their lives. Amen. Amen. Happy, happy birthday. Thank you. What day? What day? Wednesday birthday. Nine. You're 92. <gasps> Two nineties. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh my goodness. Look at you. Who <laughs> and a beautiful fifteen, right? <laughs> Happy birthday. Happy. So much to celebrate. It's a lot to celebrate. <laughs> Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. But chiefly are we bound to praise you for the glorious resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. For he is the true Paschal Lamb who was sacrificed for us and has taken away the sin of the world. By his death, he has destroyed death. And by his rising to life again, he has won for us everlasting life. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. <laughs> We give thanks to you, O God, for the goodness and love which you have made known to us in creation, in the calling of Israel to be your people, in your words spoken through the prophets, and above all, in the word made flesh, Jesus, your Son. For in these last days you sent him to be incarnate from the Virgin Mary, to be the Savior and Redeemer of the world. In him, you have delivered us from evil and made us worthy to stand before you. In him, you have brought us out of error into truth, out of sin into righteousness, out of death into life. On the night before he died for us, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. <coughs> After supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. <laughs> Therefore, according to his command, O Father, we remember his death, we proclaim his resurrection, we await his coming in glory, and we offer our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving to you, O Lord of all, presenting to you from your creation this bread, and this wine. We pray you, gracious God, to send your Holy Spirit upon these gifts, that they may be the sacrament of the body of Christ and his blood of the new covenant. 
Unite us to your Son in his sacrifice, that we may be acceptable through him, being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. In the fullness of time, put all things in subjection under your Christ and bring us to that heavenly country where with blessed Andrew and blessed John and all your saints, we may enter the everlasting heritage of your sons and daughters through Jesus Christ, our Lord, the firstborn of all creation, the head of the church and the author of our salvation. By him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And then lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the peace. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for you, the people of God. Take them in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. You may be seated.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. God, who through the resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ has given us eternal life, give you joy and peace in your faith and the blessing of God Almighty, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and always. Amen. Amen. Let us go forth in peace and love to serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Ooh, there is strength in numbers. <laughs> <laughs> 